China, a great country with over 5,000 years of uninterrupted civilization, has countless achievements in its history and endured many hardships. To this day, modern China radiates a new and impressive energy. Let us decipher through culture the answers to the magical codes that lie behind this powerful vitality. Welcome to this episode of Chinese Practice with Chinese Wisdom. Today, the cultural code we are going to explore is fostering neighborliness. What kind of spiritual trait is this within Chinese culture? We have invited British Sinologist Benjamin Coase and a young Bangladeshi student, Zeman, to join our discussion. Welcome to our studio. Take a seat, welcome. Thank you. Take a seat, welcome. In another studio, we have also invited other three guests. They are Professor Wang Yiwei, Professor Zhao Dongmei, and American historian Dr. Andrew Field. Over 100 young people from home and abroad are also present as our audience. Before we start this discussion, let's watch a short video. I think Chinese people are very kind and they try to um, treat like their foreign visitors or foreign like friends living in China like in the best way. Every day I meet my Chinese friend and say, Chou Chua, because that's my Chinese name. And, and do you want to play football with us? We play football. Chou Chua, have you eaten? I think for the most part, Chinese have, are fairly um, welcoming of foreigners. Chinese people, they're really welcoming. I love Chinese people. China is really good in cooperating with their neighbors, like uh, those projects, like Belt and Road project. We know that China is a good neighbor to our country, especially on the issue on um, improve and pull up education. Like in my country, there are a lot of developments that are done by Chinese people. China government is very kind for the neighboring country. So the one way one road is very important for Laos and China. In the short video just aired, many people mentioned Chinese people's kind and friendly qualities, reflecting the Asian Chinese wisdom of fostering neighborliness. Shall we take a look at how this Asian saying is written in Chinese? Let's invite our old friend Uncle Han Zi to analyze the Chinese character. Hello everyone, my name is Richard Sears. In the phrase Qin Ren Shan Ning, which means fostering neighborliness, character Ren, meaning benevolence, is very important. Ren is first appearing on bronze inscriptions in the late spring and autumn period. Looking at its bronze character, on the left we see the character for person. On the right is the character for two. The person on the left represents a standing person, and the two on the right is a repetition symbol. Together, the whole character represents two people standing closely side by side. So, in my view, the meaning that ancient Chinese wanted to impart to the character Ren was friendliness, intimacy, and harmony between people. The phrase Qin Ren Shan Ling Fostering neighborliness means to get along in a friendly manner with neighbors and neighboring countries. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Dr. Coase, I would like to ask you, do you know where the term originated? Yeah, I think uh, trace back to its origins, this term of fostering neighborliness first appeared in the Zhuozhuan. I first began studying Western philosophy, but then began studying Chinese philosophy in 2013 and came across this book. Um, so this book and its commentary were both written in the spring and autumn and the warring states periods in China between about 770 and 221 BC. This was about the time of uh, ancient Greece in Europe. In Chinese history, the spring and autumn period and the warring states period were times of division and turmoil. 
Dr. Coase, why do you think the concept of fostering neighborliness emerged during that era? And one important reason is the fact that the more chaotic the times are, the more people become aware of the importance of peace and the more they hope to re-establish order. So famously, it was during this period of chaos and war that many of the great Chinese philosophies emerged, with Confucianism in particular holding that to establish order, society needs to rebuild confidence in Zhen, meaning benevolence or humanity, encouraging everyone to respect others, starting with their own relatives and neighbors. Once I read a book which said, the fundamental human nature is to cooperate. This has ensured our survival as species over hundreds of thousands of years. To achieve this, we must be able to empathize and help each other when needed. So I believe fostering neighborliness seeks for people to love and get along with each other on an equal footing. Let's see how the experts interpret it. First of all, we should get close to those who possess the moral character of benevolence. And we should also draw close to the virtue of benevolence. As one of the core concepts of the Confucian culture, Ren, which means benevolence, is mentioned 105 times in the Analects of Confucius as a form of noble moral perfection. We should get along friendly with neighbors or neighboring countries and we advocate the attitude of treating neighboring countries as friends and partners. It's a model of treating neighboring countries with equality, mutual respect, and friendliness. The word ren fundamentally indicates a relationship among people. Pictorially, this word is like two people leaning on each other and close to one another. If people only act out of self-interest, it violates the principle of ren, the term fostering neighborliness embodies the traditional wisdom and way of life of the Chinese nation and has also become one of the ideological sources of what we call building a community with a shared future for mankind today. Yes, indeed. Next, we will take a look at a story from over a thousand years ago during the Tang Dynasty about a 12-year-old foreign youth who came to China to study. In 868 CE, on the sea route from Silla to Tang Dynasty, a few Silla merchant ships were plowing through the waves. On the deck stood a 12-year-old boy from Silla named Chou Chi Wan. His purpose on this journey was to travel thousands of miles to the capital of the Tang Dynasty, Chang'an, to study. After arriving in Tang, Chou Chi Wan entered the Imperial Academy to study. Twelve years later, he passed the imperial examination with honors. Instead of returning home in glory, Chou Chi Wan chose to remain in the Tang Dynasty. He remained until 884 CE, when 28-year-old Chou Chi Wan was appointed to be an official envoy of the Tang Dynasty to Silla. Upon returning, Chou Chi Wan presented the poems and essays he wrote in the Tang Dynasty to the king of Silla. These words quickly gained popularity and were greatly admired by the public. Later, Chou Chi Wan was revered by Sila as teacher for all generations. I really resonate with this story. As an international student from Bangladesh myself, I didn't expect that foreign students came to study in China over a thousand years ago. Therefore, I believe that China's policy of good neighborliness has a truly ancient history. Yeah, I think it was, it was precisely due to this friendly and peaceful attitude towards neighboring countries. Uh, also, in addition to embracing the foreigners who came to China to learn, that there were many examples of Chinese history of Chinese people going abroad to spread and exchange Chinese culture. So, you know, in the Han Dynasty, Jiang Tian's mission to the western regions opened up the overland Silk Road and promoted exchanges between the central plain civilization in China and other cultures. And during the Tang Dynasty, uh, Zhen Zhen's journey to J Japan introduced a wide range of Chinese culture to Japan, including architecture, sculpture, arts and literature, and medicine. And then in the Ming Dynasty, Zheng He's voyages to the Western Oceans not only exported silk and tea and porcelain and other products, but also imparted techniques in shipbuilding, farming, animal husbandry, and more along the way. So in, in my home and even in Britain, many noted traditions such as the gardening styles, the fondness for decorated porcelain, even afternoon tea, all originated from 
tea and other Chinese cultural products and traditions being brought to Europe in the 17th century. I have read a book before written by an Italian missionary, Matteo Ricci, who lived in China for 28 years. He commented on China as follows. Although they have well-equipped armies and navies that are easy to conquer neighboring countries, their emperors and people have never thought of launching an aggressive war. They are very satisfied with what they have and have no ambition to conquer. Yeah, I mean, from a kind of civilizational perspective, the Central Plains civilization of uh, China originated mainly from inland regions and agriculture. And so it was represented a restrained and a defensive civilization. And the survival mode and mindset revolved around self-sufficiency, self-reliance, um, embodied, for example, in traditional Confucian concepts such as frugality and neighborliness. And so for agricultural production, generations in China have prayed for stability and peace and detested war and aggression. In China, there are many old sayings like a warlike state however big it may be, will eventually perish. And harmony is most valuable, expressing the idea of fostering neighborliness. In New China, the concept of fostering neighborliness has seen new development. Let's take a look at this short video. On October 1st, 1949, at the founding ceremony of the People's Republic of China, Chairman Mao Zedong announced to the world in the statement of the Central People's Government of the People's Republic of China, that the Central People's Government is prepared to establish diplomatic relations with any foreign government that observes the principles of equality, mutual benefit, and mutual respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty. In 1954, China, India, and Myanmar responded to the call of history and jointly advocated the five principles of peaceful coexistence, mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. This became the cornerstone of China's foreign policy demonstrating China's willingness to develop and prosper together with other countries, especially its neighboring countries. Entering the new period of reform and opening up and socialist modernization, China further promoted peripheral diplomacy through mechanisms like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, China ASEAN Cooperation, East Asia Summits, Asia Cooperation Dialogue, China-Russia-India cooperation and trilateral cooperation between China, Japan, and Korea. China has wholeheartedly promoted neighborly cooperation. Here we see words like respect, equality, mutual benefit, and peace. And they are all consistent with our traditional Chinese wisdom of fostering neighborliness. In 2014, during the 60th anniversary commemoration of the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence, the then President of Myanmar, Thin Sing, stated, The Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence have not only withstood the test of time, but have also continuously kept pace with the times, becoming the guiding principles for international relations. I think it's truly remarkable that China, as a major nation, can propose and consistently practice these principles. Yeah, the original proposing of this pr diplomatic principle can be seen as drawing from the core ideals of traditional Chinese wisdom, such as fostering neighborliness and harmony and diversity, though it also made innovations to bring these concepts into the modern world. The five principles of peaceful coexistence have, have become widely recognized as fundamental principles guiding international relations. And one reason is that they embody essential characteristics of modern international relations, such as equality, peace, mutual benefit, principles that align with the modern trends of our times and the common interests of nations worldwide. Today we place even greater importance on the traditional concept of fostering neighborliness. 
the fundamental principles of the neighborhood diplomacy in the new era have significantly enriched and expanded its essence. Let's see how the experts interpret it. The key phrase fostering neighborliness that we are discussing today has been quoted by Chinese President Xi Jinping on many occasions in diplomatic settings. He has also frequently cited similar classical adages in diplomacy, such as close neighbors are better than distant relatives, and good neighbors are precious like gold. This fully demonstrates our country's open and inclusive stance and sentiments of fostering neighborliness. In October 2013, at the first ever symposium on neighborhood diplomacy since the founding of New China, China proposed its basic policy of diplomacy with neighboring countries to highlight treating them as friends and partners, making them feel secure and supporting their development, characterized by friendship, sincerity, reciprocity and inclusiveness. The concept of friendship, sincerity, reciprocity and inclusiveness is a vivid manifestation of China's commitment to peaceful development under new circumstances. Just now, our experts mentioned a very important diplomatic concept – friendship, sincerity, reciprocity, and inclusiveness. Dr. Coase, how should we understand this concept? Yeah, the friendship in friendship, sincerity, reciprocity, and inclusiveness means friendliness and intimacy with neighboring countries, assisting one another with frequent interaction and exchanges. Sincerity means being honest and wholehearted in our friendships with neighboring countries. Reciprocity emphasizes developing together with them based on the principle of mutual benefit. And inclusiveness refers to cooperating with a broader and more accommodating perspective. As we all know, in my homeland, Bangladesh, until 2016, there were still millions of rural households without access to electricity. In the same year, my homeland received loans totaling 165 million US dollars from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The China Bangladesh joint venture Para Coal Power Plant began construction and was officially put into operation in 2022. Since then, my homeland has become one of the first fully electrified country in South Asia. Yes, indeed. In line with the concept of friendship, sincerity, reciprocity, and inclusiveness in its neighborhood diplomacy, China has created the Global Public Good and International Cooperation Platform of the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's go to visit China Kazakhstan Lianyungang Logistics Cooperation Base. Hello everyone, I'm Chen Shuo. I'm now at the coast of the Yellow Sea in Lianyungang, China. It is over 4,000 kilometers away from Kazakhstan. So why is this place also called Kazakhstan's Gateway to the Sea? Today, I will take you on an exploration to find out. The China-Kazakhstan logistics base was established in 2014 and is the first physical platform project after the proposal of the Belt and Road Initiative. Goods here primarily come from Kazakhstan and some European countries. This is our central control center. Through information technology construction, we have achieved personnel exchanges business collaboration and information sharing. It's as if we've moved the gateway of Lianyungan to the doorstep of Kazakhstan. Hello, I'm Ma Hejiang, and I'm from Kazakhstan. Currently, 80% of the import and export goods passing through China to Kazakhstan go through here for consolidation and distribution. Over the eight plus years of operation of the China Kazakhstan base, the collaboration between China and Kazakhstan has enabled Kazakhstan to have its own gateway to the sea. And I'm proud to work here. Relying on the Maritime Silk Road to the east and the Land Silk Road to the west, the China Kazakhstan logistics base has built an interconnected platform. It has not only created a transcontinental logistics corridor, but also forged a friendship road for exchanges and cooperation between China and Kazakhstan. 
What we see most here is the reciprocity in friendship, sincerity, reciprocity, and inclusiveness. What is reciprocity? It is mutual gain and common development. With open arms, the Chinese people welcome countries around the world to get on board the express train of China's development. While promoting the Belt and Road Initiative, China set up the Silk Road Fund and initiated the establishment of the AIIB. The goal is to provide strong financial support in infrastructure construction for countries along the road. One major goal of this is eradicating poverty and promoting common prosperity. The Belt and Road Initiative is like the two wings of a soaring Asia. The main partners of the Belt and Road Initiative are China's labors, and they will be the first to benefit from it. What do you think, Dr. Coase? Confucian ethical principle of benevolence and humanity beginning with those around one. Since the Belt and Road Initiative was proposed, China has worked with participating countries to build many infrastructure projects, including transportation infrastructure like railways, roads, ports and airports, as we saw, as well as energy infrastructure like wind farms, solar farms and hydroelectric plants. This helps those countries achieve self-reliance and sustainable development on the one hand, and also lays the foundation for interconnectivity on the other. So I think this Belt and Road Initiative has been profoundly significant for promoting cooperation between China and neighboring countries in infrastructure, economics and trade, cultural and also people-to-people -people exchanges. Yeah, Dr. Coase, as you just mentioned, that with deepening economic and trade cooperation between China and neighboring countries, the connections and cultural exchanges between the Chinese people and the people of various countries become even closer. So let's hear the story of a young friend from Laos. Hello everyone, my Chinese name is Li Dong, I'm from Laos. In the eyes of many, trains are probably one of the most ordinary means of transportation. However, in my homeland of Laos, there was less than 4 kilometers of railway track before 2016. Given that 80% of Laos is covered by mountains and plateaus, Building railways was nearly impossible in the absence of funds, technology, and talent. But this impossibility turned around in 2016. In that year, construction on the China-Laos railway project, a key project under the Belt and Road Initiative, began in full swing. It was also in that year that I had a small dream of my own to become a railway engineer. I couldn't have imagined that this dream would become a reality just over three years later. In 2019, I was fortunate enough to become a student studying railway engineering in China. This opportunity was made possible through the Belt and Road Lensang Mekong Cooperation Project. Here, we live and study alongside Chinese students, and the teachers spare no effort in teaching us specialized skills. In my senior year, on December 3, 2021, the China-Laos Railway was officially opened to traffic. My fellow students and I watched the live broadcast of the opening ceremony together. I felt that the happiness longed for by the Laotian people was racing towards them with this train. Now my seniors have returned to Laos. I chose to stay in Shanghai to pursue my postgraduate studies aiming to become more specialized and excel in railway construction, contributing to my home country. Lastly, I welcome everyone to take a ride on the Lanzang train to visit my lovely hometown. Yeah, I think this was a very persuasive story that embodies this principle that people-to-people uh, -people affection ho holds the key to sound state-to-state -state relations. Um, not only the, the, the hard connectivity of infrastructure, as we saw earlier, but also this kind of soft connectivity through international education and exchanges, kind of heart-to-heart -heart connection. Um, in this case, the connection between the Chinese and the Laotian people. I feel the same. In addition to welcoming international students like me, China has also established cooperative institutions with other countries to cultivate technical talents. 
For example, the Lu Ban workshop initiated by China in 2016 has now been established in 19 countries, including my home country, Bangladesh, Thailand, Tajikistan, and so on. On the basis of cultivating talents, this initiative has effectively enhanced people's feelings of neighboring countries. Yeah, I mean, I'm, in my teaching, I see a lot of uh, students from neighboring countries, especially Southeast Asian countries, coming to study these subjects at my university. Um, so this reflects how China strongly supports these kind of humanistic exchanges with neighboring countries and engages in cooperation across various fields like education, healthcare, technology and culture. So this, you can see this as constructing a multitude of individual bridges of people-to-people -people ties. For Chinese civilization, amity and good neighborliness is the principle guiding our interactions with other countries. As a responsible major country, China adheres to the common values of peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy and freedom for all mankind, follows the principle of achieving shared growth through consultation and collaboration in global governance and commits itself to peaceful, open, cooperative and common development. As long as we keep to the path of peaceful development and endeavor to build a global community of shared future with the peoples of other countries, there will be a bright future for peace and development. I would like to invite both of you to affix the engraved seals for today's program. Let's go. The ocean is vast, for it refuses no rivers. Though born on the soil of China, the Chinese civilization, which went through over 5,000 years, has come to its present form through constant exchanges and mutual learning with other civilizations. Civilizations become richer and more colorful through exchanges and mutual learning. Let's join hands to open up a new prospect of enhanced exchanges and understanding among different peoples and better interactions and integration of diversified cultures. Together, we can make the garden of world civilizations colorful and vibrant. Now we are coming to the end of this series, Chinese Practice with Chinese Wisdom. Thank you for watching. Yang 说不完。